It's time to say goodbye today on The Adventures of Mac and Cheese. Mac and Cheese! That's right, this is not clickbait. I am actually selling my Maki. I wanted to make this final video uh, for the channel before we switch to our new car, and I'll tell you about that at the end a little bit. But I wanted to make this video to just go over my ownership experience and talk about why I got the car initially, um, what I loved about the car, and uh, what I thought didn't really meet my expectations and really why I'm selling my Mach-E. One of my goals with this video is to be honest, but also not to excessively complain. I've seen enough videos on YouTube where owners have a car, it doesn't meet their expectations, or they all of a sudden somehow fall in, uh, out of love with it, and they sell it and they just make video after video complaining about the car. Look, if you are complaining about the car and thinking about what videos you can make more than one complaining about it, then you have to start thinking maybe it's time to end this relationship and it's time to kind of get something I'll enjoy more. And honestly, like that's kind of uh, part of what uh, caused me to think about selling. All right, enough talking. Let's structure this video a little bit and let's talk first about why I got the mach -E, what I was looking for in a car for me and my family, and uh, what I saw in the Mach-E. So when the Mach-E was announced in November of 2019, I was blown away. I thought it was great in two respects that really hit me right away. The first is that it really was the first EV SUV that was somewhat competitive with the Tesla Model Y. I have a family. I'm also into performance driving. I also really do run an EV, and I also am really into tech. And so, you know, the Tesla is really, and was at least at the time, really the only vehicle that was on the market, the Model Y, that uh, kind of ticked off all the boxes of um, kind of an interesting car for me to look at. But for a number of reasons, which I'm not gonna go into in this video, I really was um, uh, not interested in getting a Tesla. Uh, and, and not interested in the Model Y. But on the other hand, the Mach-E, when it was announced, seemed to cover a lot of the things that I was looking for in a car. First of all, it was practical. It had basically almost the exact same specs as the Model Y down to the size of the trunk, uh, the length of the car, the interior space, very, very similar in many of the features to the Model Y, as close as Ford could get it. Obviously, they, they benchmarked the Model Y and tried to make it you know, just like that. The other thing I thought was really interesting about it, though, was the design language of how they took the DNA of a Mustang and applied it and put it onto an SUV that turned out, I think, to be a pretty attractive uh, vehicle in the end. Um, and then the third thing is, of course, I am into performance driving. I love cars. I really love when I don't have my family in the car, having a car that can hustle around and also that I can chuck into a corner and have some amount of good driving dynamics that uh, it's enjoyable to me, that it's kind of fun either around town or in a fast back road. I want to have a car that has some performance attributes to it. And this seemed, at least on paper, to look attractive, to be practical, to be an EV that had a lot of the attributes you find in the Tesla, without Tesla and Elon. And um, in addition to that, um, you know, ha had sporting pretensions. So I, uh, about a month after the car was announced, I placed an order or uh, placed a reservation for a GT Performance Edition Mach-E. And I got the GT Performance Edition because I wanted to make sure I had the sportiest uh, spec and um, thought that Magna Ride was probably something that I wanted to have in my car. All right, so fast forward to October 2021 when my car was actually delivered. About a month after uh, cars started getting delivered that were GTs and GT Performance Editions uh, from the factory, my car was delivered to me. And barely like a week before my car was delivered did the first reviews come out. Ford held a precedent, uh, strangely enough, right nearby me in the Bay Area here and journalists were able to drive the car in very kind of closed control conditions that Ford allowed them to test and sample the car in. Uh, 
and they drove the GT, GT Performance Editions mostly, I think, the GT Performance Edition. They drove it um, on an autocross course, a very small autocross course. And then they also were allowed to drive it on some, some roads in the Marin area, uh, Northern California, north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Not too many journalists actually really did try and push the car in the way I would in a uh, hills or twisty bits. One of the only ones to do so was Kyle Connor, and you can watch his video of when he tested the Performance Edition and how disappointed his face started to become and how less enthusiastic he was tempering his free trip to the Bay Area with what he found when he got there. I'm gonna let this thing cool down or do whatever it needs to do to think about life because maybe it's never been driven like that. And then so I really bought the car without having many uh, reviews of the Performance Edition out there. Um, and uh, I think this is kind of a good summary of what I was expecting when I got the car. Now, the things that I love with the car uh, and that I've had over the past year and a half of owning it and about 15,000 miles are, first of all, I think the attractive appearance of it. It just looks great. Cyber orange color, especially in a, a bright sunny day like today, really just pops. There's almost nothing like it on the road that's not really an exotic car. So really knocked out of the park with the, the aesthetics and the sporting pretensions that the car communicates through its looks. I think also the second part about it, which uh, Ford did a decent job on, is the tech in the car. Now, if you look at like the driver tech and the uh, interior infotainment technology, remember, we're talking, this was designed and released in 2019. So several years ago now, the only thing really out there that was just about at this level, it has a large screen in the middle. It has really great support for CarPlay and Android Auto. It has a volume or physical button, like literally glued to the screen. It has a very clean interior, which is very pleasant for occupants. Um, and it also has phone as a key. And uh, Ford's app was decent. It still is, uh, you know, Ford Pass. Not up to the level of the Tesla app, but pretty decent. And uh, it also worked really well to be able to open the doors and uh, was really nice uh, to have in terms of not having to take a key with me and just using what I already have with me all the time with my phone to be able to get into the car. So those like, attributes made me feel like, okay, we're sort of starting to live in the future. Um, Ford also started, and this is literally like in 2020, you know, when Blue Cruise uh, first came out, have a hands-free driving system and to start to go down that path and also to have over-the-air updates. Now, both Blue Cruise and over-the-air updates didn't actually work all that well and still don't, but they're trying. And so out of all the London manufacturers, Ford seemed to be relatively early and a pioneer, uh, or it seemed to be, in terms of some of these kind of really user-facing aspects of technology, which, um, which kind of appealed to me. The other thing I'd say about the Mach-E that was really good is it was a great family car. You know, it gave me uh, some amount of sportiness uh, and great looks and also was a really good car for hauling my family, especially on road trips. Uh, we had plenty of room in the back for the kids, very, very comfortable, plenty of room in both the cargo area and in the front, the front cargo area um, to be able to carry stuff with us. And so like as a practical family-ish type of car, Pretty decent. All right. So with all of that going forward and with, with my saying how many good things I really do feel about the Mach-E and the affection my family still has for, for our car and it's a fantastic nickname, you know, like, why am I selling this thing? It really comes down to two main reasons why I think the Mach-E is not living up to my expectations. The first is in performance. So remember I said like, I wanna have a car that has some sporting uh, uh, abilities and has some capabilities when I don't have my family in the car to be able to drive at a rapid pace, to have fun while I'm driving. And I just am finding that the Mach-E um, is really lacking in that area. You know, you basically find that uh, the car looks great, but then doesn't have the performance to back it up. Um, let me talk about some of the problems here. Uh, the Mach-E, uh, most importantly, derates itself and uh, stops 
allowing you to have all the power that the motors are capable of very, very early on. So the long range, uh, all wheel drive model of the Mach-E, non-performance, non-GT, has the exact same battery system and uh, thermal um, dissipation uh, system as does the Performance Edition. Yet the Performance Edition has wildly uh, larger motors and wildly larger thermal and power demands on that same battery. So they didn't really make the battery for the Performance Edition. They made it for the lowest common denominator, the most uh, common model they would have. And then they just decided to use it in the Performance Edition. And the problem with that is that the way the car has its thermal management strategy in the GT and GT Performance Edition is that it actually has to stop providing you power very, very soon and very quickly, or else uh, the car is in danger of literally melting its own uh, bus bars. In other words, the wires that go out of the battery. The battery itself will get too hot. And also all the other components of the system, things like the junction box that connects the battery with the rest of the car, those things will just like start to melt and uh, deform from the heat um, if they don't derate the power right away. So you basically bought a performance edition that has five seconds of fun. And literally after five seconds, the car will actually start to derate the power. And you'll wind up with the same type of power and performance that you would have if you spent $12,000 less and got a premium model. So. I feel gypped. I feel like Ford sold me a performance model in name only and in looks only and really did not uh, provide uh, any inkling that this really was just an appearance package and nothing more. And that's essentially what it is. I'd say also the other aspects of the car which are quite disappointing were the chassis tuning and the dynamics of the suspension. The non-performance edition Mach-E, which does not have MagnaRide shocks, is particularly bouncy. They left the back unsettled. And I don't know if it was more that they didn't spend the time to properly tune their chassis and the shocks and the dampening rates, or if they purposely left it unrefined because they wanted to make you feel like the back was gonna slip out and give you more uh, kind of sportiness uh, through uh, simulated oversteer. I think it just makes uh, the car feel unsettled, unrefined, and it makes you feel like you're trying to hustle around the Ford Escape instead of hauling around something that is worth the price that Ford is trying to charge for the car. With the Performance Edition, I thought since it has MagnaRide shocks, that would Ford, Ford would take more time in order to uh, tune the dynamics of the car uh, with that additional capability of the additional variability in the shock absorbers. But I don't think that there's enough variation in the modes of uh, the MagnaRide suspension, and I think the drive modes, even if you put it on the softest mode, still have a certain amount of unrefinement, bounciness, non-sportiness there. Um, and even when you go over any unsettled pavement, you find that the car is just not living up to the expectations of what you would expect from a decent, sporty, um, and even just basic EV. I, fact, I in fact, think my uh, Volkswagen ID4, for all of its problems, um, will actually uh, ride much better and more comfortable. I would say that the appearance of the car is writing checks that the dynamics and performance characteristics of the car are just not matching. So outside of the performance disappointment that I continue to have with the car, um, there's an even more worrying part that is just eating away at my brain and that really led me to decide that if I can find a good deal on something that I thought was better, that I should jump on it. And that is the reliability or unreliability of my car. Um, I've never had a car before that uh, I bought new and I bought many cars new that has had this amount of unreliability and uh, clear lack of engineering and quality control. Let me go through the four major instances uh, that I found with the car. The first two were the junction box, I'll put links to my videos on the junction box and my whole experience with it. But TLDR, part of the battery system that Ford designed for even the premium, much less the GT and Performance Edition models, um, just was under spec for the energy that was going to go through uh, what's essentially the switches connecting 
the battery, the high voltage battery to the rest of the car that was demanding up to a thousand amps or more. And basically the junction box would melt itself uh, and either would melt itself closed or open. It basically left the car immobilized or uh, would uh, have the car stop while driving. And Ford's solution to the whole problem, outside of trying to redesign the junction box to be more um, uh, durable, was to let it fail. And uh, to this day, any Mach-E made before June 2022 is a ticking time bomb, essentially. And at some point during its life, we'll probably have the junction box fail that's in that Mach-E, stranding the owner and at least requiring an enormous amount of inconvenience for the owner to take it to a Ford dealer. Ford is not replacing the junction boxes that they know are defective in all of the cars produced before June 2022. And outside of the lack of engineering, I mean, like clearly they just didn't test the car. You're able to fry a junction box, one of these original junction boxes, very quickly. Um, outside of not testing and not doing proper quality engineering on the vehicle, uh, the way that they're handling it is basically in Ford's uh, short-term uh, benefit and not to the benefit of keeping uh, long-term customers that they've uh, worked very hard to get with uh, what was clearly a decent designed vehicle. So I felt like Ford was not on my side, was not uh, putting in the amount of money to support the car properly, and is waiting for it to fail and inconvenience me and my family uh, in order to save a couple bucks. So they saved about $2,000 by not replacing my junction box proactively, but they've lost a customer for life because I am not interested in having these type of experiences, both with the initial engineering of the car being inadequate, but also for not supporting it properly through their dealer ever. Okay, the second type of unreliability that I'm continuing to see is in basic parts that I feel should be things that Ford should know how to do. This is not the first car Ford has made with a hood and not the first car Ford has made with a hatchback. Yet both the hood and the hatchback on my car are failing or have failed. Let's first take the hood, which has in it a frunk. So Ford put a normal hood uh, and hood latch on their car with a electric actuation, uh, which will pop the hood and allow it to be opened um, without having to, uh, to grab in and have a manual latch in the front as a safety feature. The problem with that is that they probably didn't test it enough. Uh, so my uh, hood failed just because I used the front and opened the hood probably a lot more than you would on a gas engine car. So uh, my hood failed in a way that made the car undrivable. I got it to the dealer and the dealer had it out of service for over a week in order to get a new uh, hood latch put on the car. So that was pretty frustrating. And then let's go to my hatch, which um, every so often and with more frequency will not open fully, or when you ask it to close, will not close fully. Um, and in addition to that, it's clear from uh, the internet forums, what's starting to happen is sometimes the hatches open uh, on their own. And so the car could be sitting in your garage and the hatch will open and will inextricably just randomly open and hit your uh, garage door if it's close enough. And that causes hundreds of dollars of damage to your hatch. Um, and Ford has no fix for this. You know, people have taken to, to the dealers, the dealers have done all sorts of different things, including in some instances, Ford has had the dealer replace the whole hatch uh, with a new one and send the hatch that uh, they think is defective in some way back to Ford for them to study it. When they put on a new hatch, the dealer does it in a bad way. And so it's not adjusted properly. It has rattles. It sometimes does the same thing again. I just, I, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to go through that. And I certainly don't want to spend more time with Ford dealers. I've never seen in a year and a half of holding a car, how much kind of annoyance and hassle and inconvenience in my life and just flat unreliability um, in a car, as I've seen with this. And so like, you know, when it gets to the point where you get in the car and you worry about whether or not the car is gonna break down on a road trip or just driving uh, in normal ways that you would take a car to work on a highway, then you have to start thinking about, is this the right car relationship for me? Um, Ford will fix the car when it's broken, but 
you know, there's a cost in that uh, to your sanity and to your life. And uh, at some point, it's better to see if there's something better out there uh, a year, two years, three years after the Mach-E was designed um, and to go for that. Okay, I hope you're still with me and that this was not too much of a complainy video. I do like to be honest and upbeat if I can uh, on my channel, but you know, gotta call it like it is. Uh, I started looking around and seeing if there was anything better out there for me uh, that would meet kind of the same criteria being sporty, uh, an EV, having some fun driving chuckability, um, doesn't need to be a track car, but also needs to have some modicum of reliability. Part of that is I didn't want to get a first year car. Uh, I wanted to get something that was out probably for a year and that all the early uh, adopter niggles were kind of uh, gone from it. And if you stick around for the next video, you'll see what the channel is going to become and our new vehicle. But uh, to close this out, I just wanted to uh, give Mac and Cheese a send off as it gets put in the hands of driveway.com and is off to its new and perhaps forever next owner home. So thanks for sticking around to the end of this and thanks for being subscribers to this channel. I think the types of content I'm gonna be doing will still continue, although the car is gonna be red now instead of Cyber Orange. Godspeed, mac and cheese.